This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Friday Fellows Conference. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Scott Gagnard, who's one of our first year clinical fellows. Scott is a native of Louisiana, did his med school at Louisiana State University, did his residency here at Emory. Uh, and as you can see, he's going to talk to us today about hibernating myocardium. Scott, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Williams. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I picked a uh, interesting topic, one that honestly thoroughly confused me as I started fellowship. Um, we, you know, we learned about the hibernating myocardium med school. We've all been there, and it seems like a very simple concept. When we come here to to residency and fellowship, we start taking care of patients. It's actually much much more of a convoluted topic. So I wanted to kind of get into it, learn more about it, and kind of present it here today for both you know my understanding, the fellow's understanding, and to get some perspective on this further. Um, let's see here, nothing to disclose. Uh, so pretty simple objective, just want to build on the theory of hibernating myocardium, kind of where it came from, what are some of its roots, look at some of the uh, good randomized trials we have that kind of relate to ischemic cardiomyopathy and the hibernating myocardium, and then review some of our uh, current practice guidelines. So good bit to get through. Um, I love quotes. Uh, this is one where I was in a uh, small small hospital in, in rural Louisiana. Um, this guy <laughs> told me something I never forgot, even as I, as I moved into cardiology fel fellowship, and just said, the graveyard is filled with those that died of GERD. Um, and really, our history of the hibernating myocardium kind of starts with this man. Um, he looked at a bunch of data from the early 1980s and the 1970s. Um, this is Dr. Rahim Tula out of Keck School of Medicine. And um, he kind of postulated this idea of the hibernating myocardium. And it wasn't a really well accepted topic at the time. And if you look at his editorial, he actually described some of his frustrations with the recent meeting of, of kind of driving this concept forward. Uh, cardiac dysfunction at the time was not really accepted as being a reversible process. It was basically a patient had an injury. They had something like a heart attack, there's necrosis, there's cell death, and there's fibrosis, and really abnormal function afterwards. And that was just kind of it. There wasn't this idea that somebody could be suffering um, in a state where there's not any clinical evidence of it. So he, um, in the 1980s, kind of started to drive this topic home when he started looking at more and more data of, of cabbage patients. And we, we see one of these on the right of a, of a study he looked at and what he put in the editorial itself, where we take an LV that's weak. Um, they looked at the coronaries and found that the LED was basically completely stenosed. Um, they gave the patient some nitroglycerin, and they noticed that there was some improvement in LVEF. And then afterwards, they decided to go ahead and revascularize the patient. And sure enough, that LVEF improved. And so what he postulated with from this information for some other data that the LV can, can live in the state of impaired function due to reduced coronary blood flow. We can alter that based on either changing the work of the, of the LV or the myocardium or increasing his blood flow. And basically, the concept just boils down to improving the supply and demand mismatch. And we kind of called this, and he called it a self of act of an act of self preservation. Uh, the LV kind of protects itself from damage. And like I said, the idea of, of silent ischemia was a hotly debated topic at the time. It wasn't something that was readily accepted um, in the literature. Um, the idea that angina can be present or not present, but the patient still had ischemia to their heart was was not something that everybody really really thought of and believed was true. Um, so they did some some early studies. Here's just a small one and a good example. Um, where it's very simple. They basically put patients with diagnosed stable angina based on treadmill testing, and they just gave them a monitor and had them just walk around their daily life. And they found some pretty interesting data from this. Notice this is in 1991. They uh, but up on the top there, as you can see, um, they have number of reported episodes, both with pain and without pain. So every time they saw ST depressions, they recorded it as an episode of of, of coronary ischemia. You notice that most of the patients actually didn't have any symptoms of, of this ischemia. And down below, notably as well, in the other histogram, they noticed that patients were having ischemia via ST depressions on their EKGs at heart rates much lower than they found um, in those that were undergoing the exercise testing. Um, so very interesting. And so what they what they kind of postulated and what their conclusion was that there was evidence of this stable, silent ischemia during daily life when our patients were walking around doing their, their normal day-to-day -day activities. So he postulated with this that silent, silent ischemia could exist and the heart could hibernate as a result and kind of protect itself. And so uh, simply put, uh, chronic occlusion of the epicardial vessels without any acute infarction. I think that's important here. I'm not talking about stunned myocardium from an AMI or anything like that. We're talking about chronic occlusion 
uh, which leads to inflammation, hyperperfusion of that ventricle, and what he called the smart heart, a reduced ventricular function and cellular activity. Heart copes with stress. It preserves itself um, to prevent, prevent further damage, and that leads to something that we call today the hibernating myocardium. And we view that as things with wall motion abnormalities, decreased contractile strength. So logically, if you could improve the blood flow, then you should theoretically also improve the contractile function of the heart. Um, and there's plenty of data on this, a lot of observational data, uh, that looks at this, especially with cabbage and revascularization, revascularization via cabbage. And this 1984 study, and he used, he looked at this as well, but Burnage et al., they actually evaluated the regional wall abnormalities with echocardiogram and, um, and early PET imaging. Um, they found that those that had um, recovery of their, um, of their abnormality function, their normal wall motions, was actually seen with those that were revascularized. Um, and they showed it both with, like I said, with echo and then this fine example of early PET imaging. Um, apparently, this shows improvement. I, I can't see much, but you'll have to believe me on that. Uh, and what they said was the results show reversible asynergy at rest. So it was not due to permanent scarring, and there's a growing body of evidence in this early time of the hibernating myocardium. Um, and they kind of proved it in multiple ways that the heart could improve its function for someone that didn't have a heart attack but had chronic disease. We can get even lower and smaller. And this 1997 study actually looked at some histologic data and interestingly enough, and I think very, very important for this topic, they actually describe uh, the hibernating myocardium as degeneration instead of adaptation. The fact that the heart is not undergoing this protective form, but also degenerating over time. Um, they showed a couple of different, or actually a lot of different uh, studies of different molecules and protein structures on the left is some glycogen storage, um, a significant number of them on the hibernating myocardium or the disease segment. And they also looked at Desmond. And if you guys uh, remember Desmond from back in medical school, it's a very, very important protein structure for uh, skeletal muscle, both in the heart. Um, and and it's a uh, contractile function and in disease vessels, I'm sorry, disease heart muscle, we actually see that Desmond um, is in kind of a cellular disarray. And they looked at a number of different proteins and found this all to kind of be true and line up. And so what they said was that as the O2 supply is chronically reduced, the G generation can go from extreme to slight and recovery is kind of dependent on revascularization. Uh, but they said it wasn't just this protective um, mode. It was actually this downward spiral of uh, reduced cardiac activity. So they made some pretty uh, important observations, I would say, that most importantly, that the cellular structures were in this disarray um, and the sarcomeric skeleton was in a complete disorganization. And these hibernating areas weren't protected. They were actually um, on this downward spiral, like I said. Um, and from a histologic perspective, they saw recovery in all the patients that they um, that underwent cabbage to these diseased areas. And notably, they didn't find any evidence of death, um, no apoptosis in these, in these cases um, of the tissue biopsies. And so the others included, and again, in a logical way, that practical consequences of this finding is that if these cells are undergoing Adap not ad adaptation, but degeneration, then the patient should undergo cabbage without delay to improve that function and prevent further problems. In 2015, uh, we, we looked even further uh, on a molecular level now, we looked at gene and transcription factors um, that could be altered. And what they did was they took pig models, they gave them an artificial stenosis, and then they um, revascularized them with PCI. Um, on the right is more histologic data. We look at myocytes and their um, and the number of them over time, both before and after PCI. And we found that um, based on the untreated to the treated uh, groups, that the number of myocytes proliferated um, as revascularization occurred. And then over here on the left, we also see that transcription factors, especially stress proteins, and then other contractile proteins went from an, uh, this upregulated up area uh, to this downregulated zone over time for the revascularized um, uh, pig, pig vessels. And kind of putting things together, there's a, a good meta-analysis for the last 30 years of the before the turn of the century where they compiled a number of papers, 24 of them, almost 3,000 patients, um, mean age of 60s, uh, reduced LVF, and they uh, looked at viability in what they call the hibernating myocardium at that time. And uh, they looked at a number of patients that underwent revascularization, over 1,000 of them. The rest of them, just medical therapy, and looked at viability at that time as well. And the results are pretty startling. I mean, they found that a near 80% reduction in death compared to those that received just medical therapy alone, which is a huge, huge, huge change in what we, you know, what we expect. And so the authors concluded that there was a very strong association, not only with viability, but LV dysfunction and risk of death. And that may be improved with the vascularization, as you can see in these, uh, in these graphs here, that 
in just about every every state, viable, non-viable, there was an uh, improvement in death rate. And they notably also said, and one I think will be a theme here, is that the worse the LV function is, the more and the more viability present, uh, patients kind of improve the most and their mortality benefit is the greatest. Um, this is uh, notably under contemporary medical therapy. And uh, if you look at some of the biases and limitations of their study, they actually note that individual patients' medical therapy regimens may have varied widely. And um, I think this is also another kind of key point in the history of the hibernating myocardium is what is medical therapy, especially at this time in the late 1900s. Um, and so if you look at Ram Tool's original editorial, he notes that many patients were on beta blockers and nitrates for angina, and this was kind of considered medical therapy uh, back then for patients suffering from this. And I want to forget about each uh, heart failure GDMT. So it's far, 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 um, not, not in the field of view just yet. This is in the 1980s where the first available statin was just coming out. And this is a statin that I uh, honestly have never heard of, never seen used before. Um, so we've come such a long way, which is now, I think, a $25 billion industry. So not only was GDMT not around, there weren't even statins. And so medical therapy had not even reached a level that we currently have today or even close to it. So perhaps we have a little bit of a, uh, a fallacy here between revascularization and the hibernating myocardium was kind of misconstrued an area where GMT and the medicines we have today weren't really present. So a better question is not whether revascularization improves outcomes, whether our current medical therapy here today has a better effect, and not to mention a safer one as well. And just um, some background information, since we're talking about GDMT, really the turn of the century kind of showed us in the late 1900s. Um, 1990 showed us that um, GDMT kind of prospered. ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, and MRAs all came around the turn of the century there. And here's just kind of a nice graph reviewing that, starting with consensus. And then we see some of the beta blocker trials coming in in 1999, the MRAs soon after that. And then as we move forward and forward, we start to see the RNA trials. And then last but not least, the SGLT2s that have just come into, come into the field of view here. So First, um, first objective that we have was just kind of describing the hibernating myocardium. And really, it's just a, what I want you guys to think about it as and how I kind of perceive it is it's not only adaptation chronically, but also degeneration of the heart muscle um, due to reduced levels of coronary blood flow. Um, these changes are chronic and they occur just about every level. Macroscopically, we see that on echocardiogram and via PET imaging. We see it histologically. We even see it in molecular basis as well. And there's plenty of observational evidence that shows reperfusion improves contractile properties of this muscle. Um, before we get into some of the kind of landmark trials, um, another quote that I've always appreciated, and I think kind of odes to the number of uh, people that worked on these trials that we're about to review, and it's just uh, medicine is the only profession uh, that labors to incessantly destroy the reason for its own existence. And I'm sure you guys have all seen this picture. This is a, a cardiac surgeon. Uh, his name is, is um, I'm forgetting his name right now. This is a 23-hour uh, surgery for a uh, heart transplant. Um, and I believe the patient um, outlived the, uh, the cardiac surgeon as well. Um, and so we look at one of the, really one of the most important trials, I think, that we have in cardiology, which was a stitch trial. And the, uh, the original article name was a coronary artery bypass surgery, patients with left ventricular dysfunction. The way they have the stitch invest investigation was a chronic ischemia and chronic recovery, a landmark trial, randomized trial with uh, patients with reduced LVEF and coronary disease that were amenable to cabbage. And it was a study for about six years with 200 pa um, 600 patients in the medical group, 600 patients in the medical and cabbage group. And their outcome was simple. They just looked at mortality compared to the medical therapy alone, those that underwent cabbage. Um, and GDMT was present here. Uh, Long-term follow-up, you'll notice that beta blockers, ACE inhibitors um, as well, and ARBs were about 90%, and MRAs were about 50%. So room for improvement, but definitely a lot better than um, some of the original data that we looked at. So GDMT was present in this trial. And surprisingly, and unfortunately, they found that no significant difference really existed in the primary outcome for the cabbage versus medical therapy group. However, there was a pretty big signal that something was going on. You know, they saw that death from cardiovascular causes improved in those that received cabbage. There's uh, redu reduction in hospitalizations as well. Um, and so the, the investigators found that, that their primary outcome was negative. There was evidence that there, uh, there seemed to be some benefit um, that was slowly but surely coming about. But it was unfortunate. We, you know, we had this all this observational data that that these patients should improve and should improve pretty drastically with um, with revascularization, yet they didn't. Um, 
And so the stitch really, the original trial really didn't have much of an effect on the guidelines. And this is the, the 2009 focused update from the 2005 practice guidelines for heart failure. And really, if we put our eyes on the bottom of the, uh, the paragraph here, it says that despite these theoretical possibilities, however, coronary vasculation has not been shown to improve cardiac function or symptoms or to prevent reinfarction or death in patients with heart failure and no angina. So we have this uh, very logical um, idea of hibernating myocardium, and yet uh, in our attempts to fix this, we found that it, it truly doesn't really help patients. It was unfortunate. Um, so uh, what I've learned from the STITCH trial is just kind of never give up. So this is Stephen Voigt. Stephen Voigt uh, started 0 for 35 in his, in his career at bat. That's 0 for 35 plate appearances. So that's well over 10 games without a hit. And he finished his uh, career with 239 batting average. So decent for somebody in the in the major leagues. But he started off so slow, 0 for 35, which has got to be pretty, pretty disappointing. He's now doing quite well as a manager of the Cleveland Guardians. So Stephen never gave up and neither really did the stitch investigators. And so what they decided to do was just kind of expand this a little bit longer. And they, they, we, so now we have the stitches trial, which is conducted over 10 years and not the six original six year studies we can see. And sure enough, expanding the time um, and follow up for these patients showed an actual benefit, not only death from cardiovascular causes, but death from any cause or cardiovascular um, hospitalizations as well. Um, so a pretty big, pretty big change here and actually showed what we really wanted was a positive trial for these patients. And um, I just want you to notice that for a couple of patients, when we break them down, the worst, the LVEF, um, we won't really talk about the stratums in, in this case. And then the increased number of disease vessels actually pertain to a better outcome for these patients. And so the sicker the patient, uh, the, the lower the LVEF, the more disease the vessels, the more they really improve from this. Um, the survival is pretty impressive. It was over eight years for the cabbage or nearly eight years for the cabbage group and about six a little bit over six years for the medical therapy group. And the survival was about a year and a half longer in the cabbage group. Um, and the number needed to treat was actually not significantly high. It was only one in 14 patients. So for a, a very routine surgery, though a dangerous surgery, very routine surgery for cardiothoracic surgeons, you know, you know, only one in 14 patients really needed to receive this to actually get a benefit. So perhaps our actual theory was correct after all. We only need a little bit more time. And so the logical thing to now look at is if the patients improve with cabbage and we can in, improve this this theory of the hibernating myocardium, then naturally if if we're improving their lifespan, we're reducing their hospitalizations for heart failure, then the pump function must get better. Their LVEF must get better. And so logically that should be the next case. But in reality, that's just not true. Um, and so when we look at viability in LVEF in the same cohort of stitch patients, um, they looked at Viability is a centerpiece and LVEF is a centerpiece and the reviews were blinded. They use SPECT and WMEAN stress testing, which is, you know, not obviously the standard that we use today. Um, and they, they kind of gave some definitions of what the viability was. And they found that really there wasn't a, a ton of difference between the LVEF and those that received revascularization and those that did not. So um, just a few things, the LVEF was about 27% in these patients underwent cabbage and the group with when this is with myocardial viability, it was only about 27%. And then initial LVF, 27%. Patients underwent cabbage. The group without myocardial viability was around 24%. And, um, there was no, p was not um, less than 0.05. It really showed no significant difference here. Um, when we look at LVEF, which I think is the more important part of this of this trial, um, we showed, there was, they showed that there was no real change in mortality. There was no correlation between LVEF improvement and those that actually were received mortality benefits. The, fun the pump function is not actually getting any better for these patients, yet they're surviving longer. Um, and just of note that there was a little bit of a difference between viable myocardium and LVEF. And so those with more viable myocardium tend to have a, um, a stronger um, ejection fractions afterwards for revascularization. Um, however, there was a note that there was quantitatively no real correlation between the number of segments disease and the improvement in LVEF. Um, so just more segments that were that were down doesn't mean the LVEF will improve after revascularization. So they concluded here that viability did not predict long-term survival advantage in those undergoing cabbage, and there was a modest improvement in LVEF. And compared to viable and non-viable myocardium. However, again, this is irrespective of survival benefits seen. And there were some criticisms of this trial, not to not to escape that. And we, you know, we obviously don't have uh, the more common PET scans that we do today or MRI. And then another more important question is what about targeted revascularization for these viable segments? And we'll get into that in a second. So before we move on, we'll just refer back to Rahm Tool et al. And, and really what he what he talked about and some of this early observational data and really 
Restoration of status said restoration of flow equals return of cardiac function and contractile function. And the ra randomized control data says that this is not the case and that these, these, these segments do not improve and do not get stronger. Observational data also said restoration of flow improved mortality and more or less it did. You know, we see that with randomized control data, there was a restoration of flow and improvement of mortality in some patients and those that underwent cabbage. And so there was at least some positive aspects to these trials. So I think one of the most important trials in the last couple of years was a revived BCIS trial. Um, and this is where we kind of come into play as cardiologists and um, we looked at percutaneous revascularization for ischemic LV dysfunction. And so what if we tar targeted revascularization for these, for these ischemic patients? And they took 700 patients, divided them into two groups, um, either PCI and GDMT or just GDMT. And they watched them for about three and a half, four years. And they asked a simple question here as well as does PCI prevent death or hospitalization? When the investigators found out is with these patient characteristics, the majority were uh, NYHA 1-2. They had little to no angina, which is important. Their EF was less than 30%, and one-third of the patients had triple vessel disease. Volatility is determined in a much more um, a new fashion, kind of standard fashion that we have today. And then you'll notice here that CMR and uh, PET were, were more present in, the, in these trials than they were previously. And PCI was done. They targeted all proximal lesions subtending areas of viable myocardium. And so success, success in at least one of these lesions was 98%. So they had a great, a, a great success rate with this trial and actually improving blood flow and revascularizing these lesions. Um, next were, was GDMT present, which is always important in these trials for heart failure and ischemic cardiomyopathy. And overall, yes. Uh, it was very actually very similar, uh, though a little bit higher than the STITCH trial. And they showared that ACE Arbor Arnies are present in 99% of patients that at chronically, uh, beta blocks were over 90%. MRAs were, again, around 55%, per usual. MRAs can kind of get left in the dust. Um, SGLT2s weren't quite as accepted during this time, and so we don't really see them um, them used just yet. So the primary investigation, or I'm sorry, the primary outcome was, unfortunately, there was no real difference in death or hospitalization or, or any um, change in, in heart failure outcomes here. Um, and so the p value did not change significantly here. Unfortunately, so this is a negative trial overall. And when we look at some of the forest plots here and some of the hazard ratios, we see that uh, since years of randomization, the PCI group and did not outpace the optical medical therapy group in terms of their primary outcomes. And if we break this down more, logically, one of the things you want to ask is, was revascularization successful? And so if you look through the supplemental figures, we, we actually see a great a great plot that shows that those with um, revascularization indexes greater than 80% compared to those without um, and compare them to the OMT groups, we also see again that there was no difference. And so patients that had what we would call perfect revascularization did not show an improvement compared to those that did not. Um, we break these guys down a little bit further into subgroups. There was no real difference in the hazard ratios and no improvement one way or the other between these two there, these two groups. And this is irregardless of age, NYHA, A, A class, um, or BMP levels. And uh, unfortunately, there's no difference in LVEF either between these two groups, which shouldn't be surprising compared to our data before. LVF remained relatively the same. Um, this is a shorter duration, but very similar to our stitch results. Um, and surrogates for heart failure events were also more or less the same as well. There's no reduction in heart failure emissions. There's no change in BMP. And there's no change in device implantation. This first graph shows that for the most part, devices were, were put in at the same pace, though there's a slight difference here. It was not significant. BNP con con um, concentrations did not really change whatsoever, and hospitalizations did not change either. There was some positive points to this trial. For the first couple of years, patients that underwent PCI had an improved quality of life, but unfortunately, after about those two years, this, this effect leveled out. So conclusions um, from this trial is that unfortunately, PCI failed to improve LVEF compared to ONT alone. And revascularization added no survival benefit compared to ONT alone as well, and they had you know, a nice, a nice graph, which just shows some of the, um, some of the important trials that, that have shown uh, some of this data, our revived trials in there. And I also see our stitch trial, um, which has kind of the longest duration of outcomes. And uh, next, and something that's uh, very important here at Emory and something we're actively investigating is chronic total occlusions and whether this is kind of the next frontier for, for the hibernating myocardium. And if there's ever a clinical case that should correlate with the hi hibernating myocardium theory, it should be CTOs. There should be a disease vessel chronically, um, and then there should be an abnormal segment um, that is being supplied by this. And so for all logical scenarios you can kind of think of, 
uh, fixing a CCO should improve the heart function itself, should at least improve that wall. And so these investigators of the REVAS trial asked that very question. They took about 200 patients, divided them into two groups, and, um, and opened up the CTO to see if the LVEF would change. And the way they looked at that was uh, via segmental wall thickness with CMR. Um, I know this is studies, this is a, a study done in the late 2000s, early uh, 2010s. In the REVAS trial, uh, CTO success was defined by basically Timmy throw, uh, flow grade three and this re a residual stenosis of less than 30%. And there is no significant periprocedural com complications or in the hospital for the first couple of days afterwards um, to define good CTO success. And just like our, our uh, revived BCI, uh, BCIS trial, there's no significant difference. This was a negative trial in, um, in all CTO segments or dysfunctional CTO segments. So the negative endpoint there. So they looked at the... Um, the um, segmental wall thickness and found that there was no changes in the overall in the overall outcome between these two groups. And this is, like I said, over six months um, time. And this effect was seen across all endpoints as well. So um, uh, regardless of age, how sick the LV was, there was no real change in the in terms of functioning. Um, and so in this randomized trial, this is also a negative study, which failed to show any regional wall motion changes via CMR. And there were some limitations. Um, this is obviously a very, very small trial. It was not blinded, so selection bias could could play a part. And last but not least, there was an interesting point that substantial portion of patients did not show any significant dysfunction in the CTO segment. So that begs questions as well. So last but not least, we really look at the data, and there's not really a whole lot uh, for coronary disease and revascularization in these guidelines in our most recent ones. And really the number one, the most important one here on the right is um, what our data shows and what we just reviewed. And, and for patients with reduced LVEF, suitable coronary anatomy, and they can undergo surgery, there is a benefit, the, a benefit to both symptoms, importantly, cardiovascular ho hospitalizations and long-term all-cause mortality. And um, as they, as they kind of noted, in the guidelines, it said, um, despite the significant observational evidence and some of the, some of those evidence we actually reviewed today, RCTs have not shown that viability imaging improves guidance of revascularization to reduce uh, adverse cardiovascular outcomes. And viability is a whole other topic altogether, but I think it has some correlation with, with this hibernating myocardium theory. So really three questions for three trials and some conclusions here that I, that I kind of generated. And one was, does a stitch trial corroborate the positive changes in LV function seen early observational data, and it doesn't. You know, we do not see improvement in LVEF, but we do see that in those that are good candidates for cabbage, we do see an improvement in mortality over 10 years, which is which is very, very important and kind of the 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 outcome that we always want and want our patients to live longer. Um, and does the review, revived BCIS trial change the way we, we actually view revascularization in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy? In reality, no. So PCI does not improve outcomes for these patients. Uh, with fear of ischemic cardiomyopathy or reduce their heart hospitalization for heart failure. And do we have early CTO trial data to corroborate the theorem? Based on the REVAS trial, uh, there's minimal evidence of revascularization of CTO improves ventricular function in that area. So for me, the conclusions are that um, from everything that I've seen, that hibernating myocardium is very much real. I think there's no there's no doubting that. Just like the stunned myocardium is real, the hibernating myocardium is very real. But I think from a functional standpoint, and one in clinical practice, I don't, I'm unsure if it leads to actual hard patient-centered outcomes, um, unless these patients are a very, very particular group that are, that are amendable to cabbage. Looking at the stitch and revive data, um, I think a good question is, you know, should we move away from pursuing invasive coronary angiography for these patients just based on regional wall motions, just based on our normal PET scans, and instead just focus more and more on our efforts of GDMT and consistent GDMT use. Um, that's really about it. And I just want to thank Dr. McDaniel for this, for this beast of a project and, and putting me on this and thank you guys for coming here. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Scott. Nice review of the topic. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, Scott, Stan Sherman, uh, I guess showing us that, that what happens on the, on the cellular level with time uh, in these patients um, with the, you know, stun myocardium. Does, uh, did any of the studies really look at the time to revascularization as being, you know, uh, and then split up the time to revascularization in terms of their outcome data? Uh, 
Um, I did not see for the trials that I looked at. I did not. It's a good question um, because I I was a little surprised when I was reviewing that adaptation versus um, protection um, in that downward spiral. I actually didn't see much data on on time revascularization from from the trials that I reviewed. But that's that's a really good really good question. So Scott and I were sort of talk. No, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. Uh, Scott, it's a great subject and a great uh, presentation. Uh, I can tell you that if you choose the patient's right, it is helpful to them. Uh, the EKG means something. I mean, if they're cued out all the way across the precordium and you look and, and you go to the second modality, which, which is often echo, and the myocardium is bright, there's nothing to suggest muscle in there, then no, nothing much is going to happen. But uh, if it's not like totally scarred in, you can then go to things like, uh, as you mentioned, like a PET FDG and uh, pick them out. And if you choose them carefully, uh, Robbie and I and Stan have seen their ejection fraction increase, but most importantly, uh, you see them clinically improve. So, uh, but they have to be carefully selected and uh, try to find that hibernating myocardium. Absolutely. All yeah, right. That, so Scott and I were sort of talking about this before the talk. I mean, we've sort of, I, I've seen the pendulum sort of swing back and forth. I remember a time when we used to sort of twist ourselves a little bit into a pretzel, um, trying to figure out, you know, whether the, you know, LED segment was, uh, whether the LED segment was viable or not before sending them for bypass versus not. And a lot would hinge on these studies, which, you know, and, and, and shout out, I, I do want to shout out to Dr. Pat, Randy Patterson and Bob Eisner at Midtown, who also did a lot of work in this uh, area and field or some of the sort of world's experts uh, in this. Um, but it's tough, you know, the imaging can be sort of tricky and difficult to sort out. Sometimes you get this sort of mixed bag, mixed, mixture of scar and, and et cetera. And, and now the pendulum sort of swung the other way, but we don't worry about as much. And if, 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 you know, we feel like they need revascularization, we just revascularize them and hope for the best, you know, and don't get as concerned about it. But I think, you know, like a lot of things, maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle where there are certainly cases where it, it can be instructive to find out, you know, what is hibernating or not. Um, and as Steve said, you know, we, we've all seen patients who really do benefit um, in the right setting um, uh, with, with revascularization. So you know, it wasn't really a question, more just a, um, uh, you know, uh, more just an observation. So, all right, other questions from the group? I'll tell you, Robbie, uh, one more comment. Uh, occasionally you'll see a patient who... Uh, who has triple vessel disease and one of those vascular areas looks totally infarcted, the scarred is dead in every, uh, every modality that you have. But uh, when you look at the arteriogram, there's a big artery with a tight lesion in it. And the surgeon is going in to bypass the other vessels. And the question comes up as to whether or not that vessel is bypassed. And I frankly don't know the answer to that question, but, uh, uh, Andreas Brunzig said something a long time ago, and uh, uh, Stan maybe remember this. You know, he, his saying was, "It's better to have an open vessel than a closed vessel." And watching all the things that our our uh, our uh, Bill Nicholsons do, uh, having something open down there in the longer run might be helpful as you try to open up something else that might be closed. But uh, that scenario comes to mind, and you will encounter it. I don't know the answer to it, but uh, it's out there. It stands, Steve. I agree with you. It's just it depends on the patient and uh, and their symptoms a lot. And this these were not exactly symptom trials. They were uh, they were stun myocardium trials. And you know you you'd love to take these trials and go back and see what happened to those who had symptoms and who didn't. You'd love to see those who got revascularized early and those who didn't, uh, you know, it's just, you know, to see what happens at the cellular level with time, 
uh, makes you, uh, you know, makes time sort of important here. And so I, I, I agree with you, you know, you never know, you never know. It's just like, if you get in there and these vessels are, are doable, maybe, maybe we should continue to do them, but you'd love somebody to take the data from these trials and go back on them and, and look at all the various subsets and uh, maybe there's some answers there, but that was a great talk. Uh, Scott, just one one comment. Uh, I thought that they did a great job with this. It's a really tough um, subject, and I think it's really controversial. You know, this is an area that has clearly changed our thinking in the last ten years. You know, the last five years, maybe even. Um, and I think we used to be much more certain of what we were doing, and now there's more questions than answers in this. And, you know, I think that as everybody's saying, um, you know, it's probably that no one, that there, there is probably some hibernating myocardium patients that do benefit from revascularization. The, the the, and so the theory is probably, as you said, correct. The trouble is, is defining this and teaching you guys, the fellows here, which patients are the ones. We've all seen it. We think we know who they are. But how can we teach you guys? And so we clearly need better and more randomized trials on this topic. But I think that the hypothesis is now that, that based on this, the majority don't benefit. That's not that some do, but most people with low ejection fractions and coronary disease, the randomized data supports uh, a lack of benefit for the vast majority in terms of improving LV function above and beyond just medical therapy, regardless of viability or regardless, um, you know, of um, their their initial ejection fraction. So I think it's a really interesting topic. And so certainly as we think about talking with our patients, we shouldn't tell our patients we're certain we know what to do with these patients. The other thing is, you know, the the bypass takes time. To, to derive this benefit and there's early harm. So, you know, it's really making sure that we pick the right patients for bypass that you really, they need to have that 10 year um, trajectory to survive. And the last thing about revived and PCI is that we may find with follow-up that PCI looks just like stitch and it takes 10 years to PCI to benefit. We've only got three to five year outcomes in, in PCI right now. So we do need more time, but certainly the, the the pendulum has changed, and now the majority of patients, I think we should say, don't benefit. So you, we should probably lean conservative until proven that we should be more aggressive. Uh, that's my thought. That's just my opinion, and um, but I'd be interested in others. Okay. Well, um, thanks again, to everybody. Uh, thanks, Mike, for your uh, perspective there, and. Um, Thanks to Scott for the presentation, and uh, we'll see everybody next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.